The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Welcome to On the Mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum, joined by a man who has an addiction. That addiction is Chick-fil-A lemonade. It's Andy Hamilton of TrackWrestling.com. How are you, bud? I could use some Chick-fil-A lemonade now. <laughs> it sounds good, doesn't it? It does. How'd I tell you what, Kyle, hooked on that? It tastes like State Fair lemonade, like Iowa State Fair lemonade. And, and I, I'll tell you what. Sturgis Falls in Cedar Falls this past weekend, weekend long celebration. Mm -hmm. My girlfriend brings home like a 64 ounce jug of that stuff. And it was gone probably within 15 minutes of the Sturgis Uh, Falls lemonade. Yeah. And that was top, that was top shelf stuff. So is it better than Chick-fil-A? I think so. You're saying there's lemonade better than Chick-fil-A. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's out there, Kyle, man. Stay fair. Lemonade tops (laughs) Chick-fil-A. I didn't think that was possible. But isn't there something even better? What was the drink? No, the orange juice last year. The orange juice from Paris. Is that better than the lemonade? Different ballgame. What do you enjoy more, though? Lemonade. Okay, so if you had a lemonade and that orange juice from Paris, you're taking the lemonade. Maybe not at 8 or 9 in the morning, but uh, 11, 10, 11. Okay. Yeah, and probably about... 20 hours of the day, I would favor the lemonade. lemonade. Okay. So I guess See, the key, the key is like <laughs> the fresh squeezed lemons, water and sugar. That's all. That's all you need. Yeah. So they had like the right nectar. They, from the gods. They, they had the right mix there. They had the right mix. They were charging like three bucks for a refill for it, which I mean, they're probably making a pretty good chunk of change on it when you consider it's just lemon, sugar and water. But, uh, Man, that's a bargain, I think, for 64 ounces of... How quick did you down it? I think like 15 minutes or so. <laughs> the second the second refill, oh. I actually had um, oh. I had a refill of it Sunday night. We went back down to Sturgis Falls Sunday night and had a refill of it then, and then we filled it up on the way back. And so I, I downed that on Monday. So I've my lemonade intake's pretty good right now. Hey, we get some uh, to intake some Nashon Garrett. That guy lit it up at... Final X. He's our guest on the mat today. He was the show of the final leg of Final X. He had a loss to Joe Cologne in the first match, tight second round win, and then blew the doors open. Twelve to zero tech fall in that third match. Looked fantastic. Looked like the guy. Looks like if you can get that Nation Garrett every single time, he can be a world champion. He has that capability. If you get that third match, Nashon Garrett, he's got it. The ceiling's really high. Very. It's really high. The variance is pretty wide, though, too, where we've seen him have some matches where he keeps guys in the match maybe more than he should. Uh, the second match against Joe Cologne, boy, that got really dicey at the end for him. And... So it's shoring up some things. It's shoring up parterre, off, uh, parterre defense. It's uh, staying sharp and attacking, I think. I think it's keeping his foot on the pedal. That's that's his advantage. That's what he can do better than most guys in the world at that weight class is attack and score explosive scores, multiple scores. I think uh, he really let his foot off the pedal late in that second match and against Joe Cologne. And that's where things uh, got a little bit uh, slippery for him. Uh, but yeah, I think the ceiling is super, super high and it's a weight class where you look at it uh, internationally and, and the guys that were the top guys at that weight class a year ago, uh, can has gone up to 65 kilos. Haji Aliyev has gone up to 65 kilos. Talk about Raji Dov going up, uh, potentially there as well. And, and I look at 61 as a weight class where the United States can make a lot of ground up. And we talk about the team race where the United States won by a point last year and adding David Taylor and Kyle Dake to the mix. And you know, Russia is going to add some hammers at those weight classes uh, potentially as well. But uh, U.S. didn't score points at 61 last year. 
And that's a weight class where I think that uh, Nashawn Garrett, like I said, he can uh, – I think he's got a good chance to find himself on the podium if – and it's a big if, if he wrestles like he did in that third match against Joe Cologne, if he wrestles like he did in both matches against Nico Megalutis. So that that's the key. It's unlocking – those high level skills on a permanent basis. He ran the gauntlet, had to go through the U S open, then went the world team trials, then final X. So he really had a unique path to the, the finals and the world team. I think only Logan Steber had that type of run to be able to have to go through everything and go through the, the entire system. So he made it through that way. Everyone was talking about how, Joe Cologne and Nashawn Garrett had this high-scoring match at the U.S. Open. It was fantastic to watch. But I think you knew going in that he was going to scout that pretty hard, and he wasn't going to get in those positions. He was smart enough to stay out of them. Even though those were the marquee matches, you could tell he was very well prepared for what Joe Cologne could do. Didn't necessarily show it all in the first match. Joe Cologne imposed his will throughout that first match. But I think you just saw him pick up the pace, pick up his knowledge base, and just able to execute his offense. And like you said, as long as he's staying offensive, staying out of those situations where he might get on a body lock with Joe Cologne, he was going to be the guy. Yeah, and, and wrestling smart, too. I mean, there was really no need to take that shot at the end of the second match that yeah, there made, was things, nice. made things a little precarious. But, uh, yeah, I think the, the whole thing with him is, man, like I said, there's this – there aren't a lot of guys in the world that have that that kind of skill set that can can go and get to the legs as frequently and as quickly as he can and utilize the skills you have. Adam Kuhn is a great story. He made the Greco-Roman world team. We thought he might have a shot against Nick Wisdowski in the finals at super heavyweight. It didn't happen, but Nick Wisdowski... He looks better than last year. Here's a returning world bronze medalist, and he just looked sharp. He just was hitting his shots. He just was getting to the legs. It just looked like he was at a different level than Adam Kuhn. I think he is better than he was last year. I think he's stronger. I think, uh, I think we just see a guy that's it's got more confidence in his stuff now that he's gone and proven it on the world level that uh, he he's a contender to medal and uh, certainly did it a year ago in, in Paris with the bronze. But uh there was a, another layer, another level for him to climb to get up with uh, Petrishvili and Akul and Akul, three-time World Olympic champ. Petrishvili knocked him off last year in that unbelievable heavyweight final. What was it, 10-9? Yeah, maybe? That was and, one of the best. And uh, those guys, uh, they can go get points when they need them. They can go get to the legs. They can transition into turns. Um, they're, they're pretty incredible heavyweights. And, and I think that's a challenge for Nick is to separate himself from the pack that he's kind of in now, uh, with, with that next tier and get himself to tier one. Can't go through all of them or we'd run out of time, but we do need to make sure we mention the, uh, the women's wrestling portion. Helen Marulis was not there, but we were treated to the Victoria, Anthony, Whitney Condor trilogy. Here's two former world team members going at it, and they really kind of like Joe Cologne and Nashawn Garrett. They lived up to the billing. They gave us some great entertaining wrestling. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we saw over the course of Final X on the women's side, look at uh, you got Victoria Anthony, who wrestled for a bronze medal last year at the World Championships, didn't make the team. Becca Leathers won a bronze last year in Paris, didn't make the team. Some other girls that uh, involved in there, Haley Agello, 2016 Olympian, 2017 world team member, has won a lot of matches at, at uh, the highest level of international wrestling. She didn't make the team. I think what uh, you're seeing, and, and it's, you throw in the matches that went to, or the series that went to three matches as well, a couple of those in there as well. I think what, what you're seeing is some depth that's being formed now in the women's system. Which I think is great. Absolutely. I think that's the best yeah. thing that you could have because – and I tell you, I, I was talking to Mike Finn at uh, Win Magazine about this. Going back to 2003, the World Championships were in the United States. I was there, but the women's wrestling side wasn't really as much on my radar as it should have been. They had seven out of seven world medalists. They had seven weight classes, seven medalists. I looked it up. They tied with Japan on points, but I, I'm guessing there was a criteria and Japan got it. Now it's on our radar. We're thinking about it. We want to see how these women progress and, and where they go. I think they're putting out a great product, and they're only getting better all the time. 
Yeah, I think so for sure. And and not just depth, but the the level of skill that's that's on display now. You're seeing such a higher level of technique and and skill and athleticism and women's wrestling's come a long, long way since yeah. even even the twenty twelve Olympic trials. Yeah. And and to, even to the point where some people are still shocked that there's women's wrestling at the Olympic Games. It started in oh four, but Boy, just to, to think of the, the pace we picked up. And, and I don't know how much of it had to do with Helen Maroulis winning an Olympic gold medal. I would think that broke some barriers and being the first American to do that. So I think that elevated it. And I think we're carrying on that legacy in that way. But this is a, a team that really is breaking new territory. And to be part of that and to see them on this stage, I think that's fantastic that they were side by side with the men. And we get to enjoy it in this grandest stage of all which is making a world team that this is our our big event for international wrestling in the united states yeah and i think to your point about uh what what helen did in rio i i think probably the benefits of that for usa wrestling on the women's side are, are still yet to come i think that uh the young girls that she has inspired to get into wrestling or uh uh to devote more time to wrestling i think uh probably we're not going to see that stuff maybe manifest itself at the highest levels in the United States for, I don't know, five, ten more years, possibly. And d- but with Helen, doesn't it seem like she's larger than life in a way that she's not above anyone? But her not being there certainly is a storyline. If it would have been anyone else, maybe Adeline Gray if she wasn't there. But that's a big story, just that she was injured and that she's going to get postponed. Her storyline was as big as any at Final X. Yeah. Dealing with concussion from the Indian Pro League and and certainly want to see Helen make a full recovery here. We hope that uh, uh, it happens uh, sooner rather than later. Hope uh, for her sake that uh, she can get ready to go here and have that special wrestle off and and compete to the best of her ability. Because what we've seen here has been uh, this three year stretch, that three year run that she's on. Talk about what she did in Rio, but uh, the yeah. the last two world championships, she hasn't allowed a point. She hasn't allowed. I didn't even realize from 2015 she didn't allow a point. Right, right. I didn't even break that down. I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think it was like maybe 34, 35, 0 in Vegas, and she cranked that up to what was it, 52 or 53 yeah. to zero in Paris. So it looked amazing. Yeah, uh, the whole way. 35 year old Sam Hayeswinkle makes a Greco-Roman yeah. world team. And, and for those who haven't followed his story, you have to go way back to college where he got third at the NCAA championships for three years in a row, got second his senior year, then finally broke through and made an Olympic team in 2012 in the freestyle side. But finally he's on the team and Greco-Roman, his first Greco-Roman world team, uh, my understanding. Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> uh, I didn't see it coming. 2012 freestyle Olympic, Olympian. It's a, what an incredible story, right? Yeah. he He's the guy everyone wants to win. He, everyone likes him. He's a, a very likable guy, and I think everyone wanted to see him get his time. And here, 35 years old, he's on the Greco-Roman world team. Just brings a smile to my yeah. face thinking about it. It's awesome. Yeah. I, I just love that story. Yeah, that, when guys that, uh, well, we're not in our 30s anymore, but when guys in their mid-30s are having success, it makes us feel yeah, young, right? it does. It, it gives you hope <laughs> that you can get out there. You're going to make a, little... a comeback, Kyle? I am. So you got a bracket I am. On, on your wall. You've had one in your office there. Yeah. it's. Uh, I, I didn't want to maybe uh, disclose all that on this edition of On the Map, but in, in a subsequent ish, edition. And we'll talk about your yeah, comeback. It's, and it's going to be against Jason Bryant of Matt Talk Online. I've always wanted to wrestle Jason. In in all seriousness, I've always wanted that to happen. And Dave Malachek at uh, lacrosse, UW lacrosse, has wanted that to happen. So if there's any way I could make that happen, and I'd want it to be public. I wouldn't want it to just be a private wrestling room match. Uh, I'd want there to be an official, and I'd want there to be some hype around it. But let's, let's make start that to hype. happen. No, yeah, I want a match with Jason Bryant. Where do you Where do you want it to go down? <sighs> I think we should Carver do a, Hawkeye Arena well, a three, match, dual meet. three match series. He went to Old Dominion. I went to Northern Iowa. So we do one there. We do another one at Northern Iowa. And then if it goes to three, we got to determine NCAA the, championships, like right before the finals. Yeah. He's announcing <laughs> it. He wouldn't be able to announce it. He wouldn't be able to announce it. Hopefully I get him out of breath so he can't do the, the finals. 
So, and I, I do, we, we talked about this last you week. You got to use I, your conditioning. I think that's your edge. <laughs> you're it like has a, to you're be like a sled dog. It has to be. I, I want Gable to come out of retirement and train me for sure. I'd have to have yeah. that, that edge. And he'd have to be knowledgeable enough that he can't push me. Like I'm a 22 year old. He's got to give these 42 year old bones a, a different. Well, yeah, that was so. Gable's deal. Right. I mean, he didn't train everybody the same. Yeah. He didn't treat everybody the same. He could push the right buttons. Yeah. And I'm hoping he'll uh, he'll do that with me as I approach my match against Jason. So, what do you think your nickname would be? You know, Jesse Whitmer, strongest man in the world. Yeah, I, I could come up with some cheesy ones like Klingon. You know, with the is that top how you game. that what you'd be? You'd be leech on top. I I would like to think so. I'd, I'd like to think that he has a weight advantage on me, so I don't know what I could do in that. I'm only a 145 pounds here, so I've got to either bulk up or really get the conditioning factor way high. So, think pace. Could, you got to get an iron side pace. Yeah. <laughs> or or weigh 200 pounds and just get some girth. That could also be a, a tactic. So, well, we got to wrap up this podcast and then get in the weight room over here <laughs> at the Gable right. Museum. Start hitting, doing some dumbbell curls, and I like it. Will you train me a little bit too? I'll try. Okay. I'll Maybe, push you. I'll hold you accountable. At least write a story about it and, uh, and and do some hype for me. I'd appreciate that. And and I have some ideas, too, going back to last podcast about the wins above replacement. Okay. Before. So I think I've got it half figured out, but All there's right. another half that needs to be cultivated and thought through. But somehow it needs to incorporate our idea for how dual meat should be scored. And so our idea is that... Dual meets should be scored 20 points for a pin, and then whatever the gap is, you just score the team points. So if you win 18 to 10, you would get eight points. And so that would factor in somehow. What I don't want... Well, well I thought we were just going to keep a running score. My team would get 18, your team would get you 10. You would. I'm talking okay. about four okay. war. Eight. This is okay. for the individual. So All right. I got gotcha. you. The, the individual would get eight points, and so you would average that out somehow, and then whatever that average would be would be your wins above replacement. Okay. But what I don't want to happen is that I want to give credit for the guy that wins a 17-16 to 16 match over a guy that wins 3-2. to two. So I don't know how you separate that because it's still one point, but I want to be able to factor in high-scoring matches, and I just don't know how to do that yet. So that's why I'm halfway there. So I'm planting a seed in your head, hoping we can make this happen so that we can come up with our war. So why, why are you going to give uh, more? Why are you going to wait the 17-16 win more than the 3-2 win? Because they're they're taking risk. I think so, you're scoring more okay, points. You, I, I, you should be I'm rewarded. with you. I'm with you on that. I appreciate that. However, wouldn't you say like a a 4 to nothing win in, in collegiate wrestling is perhaps more dominant than a 22 to 18 win. It could potentially be, I I'm with you on that, but this, for me, I want there to be incentive to score okay. points. That, that's, that's why I think we need to at least explore that half of it, that there needs to be incentive so that they're not necessarily high scoring points, but Hey, what Spencer Lee said, this is an entertainment game. We're here to yeah. entertain people. So Although a four to zero match can be dominating, I've seen two to one matches that are dominating, but I want points on the board. Me too. I think everyone else does. So Me too. That's why I, I think we're halfway there. And really, we need to pound this home. The dual meet format right now is horrendous. It just is not good for the sport. We need to switch that up. It needs to be more progressive, and maybe that's not the complete solution, but we need to have some color here so that it's not the bland three points, four points, five points, six points. We need something new. I don't know if horrendous is the word that I would use, but that's uh, that's maybe it. a little bit stronger that's than the fine. words I would use, but uh, I, I think it needs reform, and we've talked about it for, shoot, I've talked about it for five years, That uh, and it goes back to the 2013 national duels up in Minneapolis where you're watching third periods roll by and a guy leads four to one and he's completely shut it down offensively because he knows, you know, probably not going to get the major. So I'm not going to do anything to put myself in danger where I'm going to lose this match, but it's not real fun to watch a third period no. like that. And I think that uh, it's, it's always baffled me and, and it, like you'll see a seven Oh match where there's four minutes of writing time 
and that's worth three points. And then I think back to what was it, Sorensen Kalika and the Iowa Oklahoma State duel a couple of years ago that was decided by one second of writing time and yeah. in the ultimate tiebreaker, uh, eleven minutes, and that's worth three points. That's goofy to me. It's goofy, and I don't know if this is on anyone else's radar. I don't know if people think that way because I I think coaches genuinely like the system the way it is, or maybe they haven't thought about it. But I think it, they're okay with going the route that we've gone with the what one to seven for decisions, eight to fourteen major tech fall. It just you're shaking your head, and it's not good. It's not a good system for it's, it, it, the it's best It's not the best system. I think that. Uh, we can do better. I think we can do better to foster a environment that encourages more scoring and also that's simpler to understand. You know, how, how many dual meets, like with how many changes that we've made to criteria rules now? And look at Penn State, Ohio State this year. People watching that broadcast, if you're in a sports bar and you see that, uh, what was it, Ohio State was down four? Like you don't even know if Snyder wins by major. Is that enough? Like, yeah, you, know, you, you don't. Exactly. You don't know if you're you're in a sports bar where you can't you can see the screen and you can't hear what uh, the BTN crew is saying. Like you don't you don't know what the circumstances are of what Kyle Snyder needs to do to win the dual meet. And shoot, if that was up there where it's a running score and you see that you know he's got to win by thirteen. The Penn State leads by 13 going into heavyweight. You know Snyder's got to win by by 13 for Ohio State just to have a chance. But that's the thing, though. We change criteria every too, too every much. year, it yeah. seems. Every year. It where it's like res- yeah, where wrestling people can't even remember what, like, memorize the criteria. So how are people that show up and watch one dual meet or two dual meets a year or they're flipping through the stations and they see some wrestling, like, how are they supposed to know? They aren't. That, and that's the point is hey, Mike Houck, who was the national team coach for Greco-Roman wrestling, he was the first world champion our country has ever had. He got out of the sport for a while, and then he started watching Greco-Roman, I'm going to say 10 to 15 years later, and he said, I don't even recognize this sport. He didn't even recognize the rules. It was a different brand of the sport. And that, that just shows you if you aren't current, if you aren't staying on top of it all the time, especially international wrestling, you're going to fall behind. There's just really no way that you can keep up on, on the rule changes, whether it's weight classes, whether it's do you have 10 world championship weight classes this year, or there's six Olympic. You, you have to stay on top of it, and it goes back to just staying current in anything. But in wrestling, especially international wrestling, you have to stay current. You'll fall behind in a year. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Greco especially, right? Yeah. It seems like those guys change the rules like every 10 minutes. Really do. Hey, we'll end with this before we get to Nashon Garrett. There's a, a great movie on Netflix that I think everyone should check out. It's called Dangal. It means re- wrestling in Indian, the, the country India. A fantastic movie. I venture to say it's not my favorite wrestling movie, but it might be the best wrestling movie. It's about female wrestling. I think they did wrestling at huge service. Treated it with complete respect, showed the respect. Sometimes you have wrestling movies and they don't give it the respect it deserves. But if you have Netflix and you have a couple hours to spare, I'd recommend you watching that. They even got it so precise down to the rules. It was back to the ball grab system where they had the coin flip and and went that route. They had all of that correct. And I would highly recommend you go and watch that. So I don't know if you like wrestling movies. I don't know if you've watched many of them, Andy, but I hope you'll give this one a chance. I'm going to, Kyle. I'm going to go. Do you have the n- enough time to do that, to be able I to do. block that off? I do. Okay. So make sure you watch Dongle, and then we're going to get to Nashon Garrett. All right. That-, that sounds good. Our guest today, four-time All-American and NCAA wrestling champion in 2016 for Cornell University. But even bigger, he made his first world team this year. His name's Nashon Garrett. How are you, Nashon? Hey, what's up, guys? Doing amazing. Great to have you on the show. Exciting for you to make the world team. How are you feeling? You know what? I'm still a little bit overwhelmed. I, I, even the fact that you, when you guys said it, that that title, that that name, you know, world team member, that that just puts a, a spark in my my heart. It it feels really good. I haven't I haven't I don't know if I've 
processed all of it yet, but um, but I'm I'm happy for it. I'm happy for it. I'm happy that everything paid off, and so I'm uh I'm, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for what's to come too. Your match with Joe Cologne was the one that everyone wanted to watch. It went three matches. It lived up to the billing. Did you know there was a lot of hype surrounding that match? Um, I kind of figured there would be, but I wasn't aware. I, I and I kind of had a, I kind of assumed that it probably should be, you know, maybe the highlight match. Um, but yeah, they made the heavyweight match that that, uh, and I guess I can understand why. You know, you guys, you got a uh, Coon uh, and then and, and Nick Gwizdowski, uh kind of kind of going after it. But yeah, as far as like you know, excitement as far as far as rivalry, as far as uh, all those factors are concerned. I think that our match was was probably yeah, they definitely should have lived up to the hype and I think it I think it did, for sure. Going into that, you guys were the first match on the docket. Like you said, they did have the heavyweights at the end. Were you a little surprised knowing that it was gonna be a good series and that uh it, it was a, a high scoring match the last time you wrestled, that it would be the first match instead of the last? Yeah, absolutely. I had I you know, I had even talked to couple of people in common is like, oh, I thought I kind of figured, you know, and you don't want to take credit away from other people, but you know, I was definitely thinking, you know, people are going to want to see this match more than other matches. So I, I was kind of, I was, I was kind of, oh, okay, this, I, I kind of thought it was a little bit weird, but also at the same time, I was like, I kind of want to get this over with too. So I'm glad that I'm first and not having to to wait, you know, a whole hour to wrestle, and then uh, you know, it, it would just it would just been a lot longer, I guess. But I was I was I was I was happy for for the way that they did it, and it seemed to work out the way that either way it seemed to be fun and, and exciting either way. Go back to that U.S. Open match where it was an absolute shootout. When you're in the middle of a shootout, what's that feel like knowing that uh, you're going toe to toe, battling it out, scoring a lot of points? What's that like being one of the guys that's uh, putting a lot of points on the scoreboard? Well, like I always say, and like I I, I feel that I've said recently uh and and i and I, I will give i'll give him more credit this time joe Cole, more credit this time in the sense that um uh not that i, I took away credit before but I, you know i always give credit where credit is due and especially when we're using words like shootout um I, you know for me my st- that is my style i i shoot shoot or shoot and um so that's that's the way i want to wrestle and that's the way i like to keep a high pace it keeps guys uh, off me, it's my, my, my offense is, is my best defense. And so, um, that's the way I, I, I do it. Um, and I think that sometimes that, that mentality and that the way that I wrestle sometimes gets applied to other people. Whereas I don't necessarily know that Joe Cologne is, is a shooter like, like that. I think that where he's really good at is, is extremely defensively. And I think that he's good at, uh, I think he's really good upper body. And I think that, um, you know, when he does figure out his scores, like they're very particular and they're very skillfully, you know, placed. Whereas for me, like, I'm just fast. I'm like, I'm like trying to shoot your leg, you know? So as far as it being a shootout, I think that, uh, the first, the first match, I don't even think I shot in the first period. Um, but then I, I think I got to, I think I ended up getting to a couple of scores, um, at the, in the second period. And then, and then I started opening up as the next two matches went out. But, um, yeah, so, sorry, I kind of went on a little tangent there, but you know, I was kind of like to find my terms a little bit. When you had time to analyze match one before you went out for match two, what were thoughts that ran through your mind, things that you wanted to change? Things I wanted to change. Um, well, you know, I think, I think I started to open up a little bit more. Um, I, I realized I kind of started off, uh, a little bit slow. And I think the hard part about it, and sometimes I, I, I don't think we realize it, but there's a lot of emotional uh, energy that goes into uh, these tournaments, you know, especially the build up of it all, the final legs from weigh ins to getting ready to go to practicing to cutting weight. And there's a lot of emotional energy that goes in and you have to like, you have to level yourself out. So if you're not like, especially in that first match, you know, being having wrestled, not wrestled in three weeks, him not having wrestled in over a month and, and a half. And I think there's a lot of emotional energy that goes in where you have to level it out. And so that first match for me, um, I had, I definitely had brought my level down because I didn't want to r- run my energy out. 
um, I didn't want to run my energy out by being so excited for it. So um, I think I came out a little bit cold because I, I, w- I just hadn't, I just was so used to suppressing that energy for the last like, you know, three, four weeks. Um, and so, but once I started feeling it, then that's when I started receiving the energy back and kind of like, okay, get hyped, get hyped. You got this, you got this. What does it say about wrestling when you have a concentrated period of time, say two to three hours, you lose the first match, win the second match close, and then you dominate the third match. Take us through that mental progression, that roller coaster, and what that's like to be able to get to that point where third match you dominate. Wow. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the three maybe biggest factors, I think, uh, were one, uh, for some reason, I, I felt extremely comfortable. I, I felt comfortable. Um, I, I felt comfortable. And I think that the, what made me comfortable was first my having uh, my coach, Zeke Jones, there. And he's, he's chirping in my ear. He's telling me, hey, you know, he's telling me his life experience. And that's, this is one of the reasons why I enjoy Zeke's, Zeke's coaching so much because uh he's telling me hey you know i remember the first i remember you know one of my one of my uh trials finals like i lost the first one then came back and and beat him the the next two so you know this happens sometimes and that's why they do bet two out of three because the best guy's got to win and best guy will win eventually uh and it'll end up showing showing that but um going through it i i think the first time i was i was i was like okay what do i need to do and i was I tell you what, I was, it was a very prayerful place too. I think I was in a very prayerful and a very, uh, at a very peaceful state because I said, you know, I, I knew what I'd worked for. I knew how, um, what could have happened and what should have happened. And I'm wondering why it didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen. And so going back in, uh, we, we, we looked at the video. We said, okay, here's what's going on. Hey, you were a little cold the first period. You picked it up in the second period. That's awesome. You can get to his legs. You can score on him. So now you just need to open it up and make sh- and, and allow yourself to, to be free. And I think that I was still thinking a little bit too much about, okay, what is he going to do, you know, if I get to his legs and, and, and not, you know, working through those positions. So I think the, the, big, the biggest thing was having the coaching and, and uh, making sure that he was, you know, instilling in me the positive vibes and instilling me, hey, that's okay, we're good here. You know, you, I came here ready to wrestle three matches where I don't know that necessarily that he was ready to wrestle those matches, you know, and I'm hearing him in the locker room saying, you know, only got one more match, only got one match. And I'm thinking to myself, Hey buddy, you, you're going to have, a, you're going to have a little bit more to get through, to, through me. And so for me, I was, I was ready to go that time and it didn't bother me to lose that first match. Whereas I think, you know, a person who has their mind set on going two matches and being done, um, they're, they're going to be hurt when, when they, if they lose that second one, when they're like, Hey, this could be it. I could be on a world team after this, one more match. But for me, I was like, I was ready to go. So, um, coaching, the comfortability of it, the peace, uh, and then just trusting God and the whole process of it all. Um, I, I knew what I'd, I'd prayed about. I knew what, what my, what my lifestyle didn't look like. I knew that, uh, all of my training, all my efforts, all my energy, um, uh, put into this time, it would end up showing it. It always ends up showing. And, um, and that's why I enjoyed the best two out of three this time, at least, you know, cause it really did show that I think the best guy should, should, should win. Hey, Sean, of course, uh, the world championships aren't best of three. You get uh, one opportunity against everybody there. Uh, and we've seen you here over the course of the po- process, the qualifying process, uh, up in Rochester lights out in the best of three series against Megalutus, uh, we, we've talked about the first match and, and what you went through there against Cologne. Um, some, you know, the, the second match comes down to the wire. Third match lights out again. How do you get yourself to that high level all the time where it, it's not a coin flip, where you're reaching your ceiling in Budapest? Oh, great question. You know, I think um, I think there has to be a place of. Uh, you know, I think that is a, there's a train place there. I think it's a, uh, being able to train. Um, I think it's being able to train that because I think what, what made me so effective in college, um, was, you know, it didn't matter what was going on before my match. As soon as I stepped there out there and as soon as the whistle blew, like everything went back into place. Like every, I, I had the same speed, I had the same, uh, go and, uh, the same drive, the same attacks, everything was go, 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 go. And everything was meticulously planned out, hand fighting, pressure, shots, 
everything was 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 ready. But the thing for me um, that I think is, is is a blessing and a curse is is this reality that I can wrestle. I can wrestle so many different kinds of styles. Um, whereas like my style is is not just regulated to to you know one like for example I switch my legs. A lot of people don't know that, and a lot of people may not recognize that. But for those who you know who study or have studied me, they know that I switch my legs. So I I switch from left foot to right foot, and I can shoot off of both legs, which would seem nice, but it is actually kind of it's actually really confusing for me sometimes because like you know I have to know which hand to post with my back hand, which one's my which, and so there's a, I have to have a pattern and there's a system um, by which I have to, to practice and I, and I don't get away from that pattern and that system. And then, uh, you know, if there's any times when I do get away from that, that's when, like, you know, I, I may only use my left leg or my, I may only use my right leg. And in doing so, um, I actually shut myself down a little bit more. Talking to Zeke Jones, uh Earlier this week, he said that you came back to uh, Arizona State's camp and you delivered a message that was pretty powerful to uh, some of the campers there. Can you share a little bit about what that message was all about? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. I, I just really feel like God downloaded uh, to my heart to, to share with those kids about the three things that um, that make up success. And the three things that I, I spoke about were faith, hope, and love. And I think it's a, uh, it can be a little bit cliche, but I think it's, I think it's true and I think it's real. And I, and I, and basically what I had talked about was this reality of, of faith being, um, faith being experienced. Um, you know, we have to experience something in order to pr- produce faith inside of us. And I think when we come into an experience of something, um, that's, that's what produces, that's what produces good faith, especially when it's a real, true, genuine experience. Um, you know, I, for example, I remember watching Jordan Burroughs in the 2000. 17 world uh world trial finals and i remember seeing the conviction that he wrestled with and that you know he he was down and then he came back and then the way that he wrestled with such conviction with such heart it inspired me and it and it, and it instilled faith in me that i can do this and that i can continue to, to to move forward you know we talked about faith they talked about hope and and i believe that i define i believe that i define hope as um Believing the impossible when it when it doesn't seem possible, and looking at looking at um, you know you're down one match to a guy who's beat you four times in a row, right? And it's like being able to to keep that hope alive and keep that hope um, going is, is is a difficult thing, especially when life tells you that you know you shouldn't be here, or life tells you that you know you're not going to do it, and and it seems impossible, and it seems like everything's against you. Um, hope kind of keeps you going when everything in life tells you that it's not going to go. Um, and then we talked about love, which, uh, which basically is the, the driving force and which, which holds and, and is the foundation for both my faith and my hope. And so um, we talked about how uh, faith and hope, um, you know, the Bible talks about how faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So, so faith is really your hope experienced. Faith is your hope experienced. So, you know, you have a dream, you have a hope, you have something that you're envisioning, you have something that you're, you're, you're going for. And, you know, it, it could be even just like you, you're daydreaming. You're daydreaming about getting your hand raised. You're daydreaming about having a, this amazing moment or you're resting, you're taking these shots. And, like, and it's like, you know, your faith and your hope connect at that point. And it's it just, there was a, there was a lot. Um, in, in that, a lot of in-depth going to that. It was about maybe a 20, 25-minute uh, talk conversation. But, you know, lastly, love ties everything together. Um, without love, without the, especially unconditional love, for, and for me, it's not just a conditional love that, that's a fallible love from, you know, people. It, you know, it is people. It is family. It is friends. It is support system. It is all of those things. But it's 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 also the unconditional love of, of knowing that my, my father and, um, who is in heaven loves me and it's an unconditional love. So whether, so my value is not determined by how good or how good I'm not, I'm doing or how good I'm not doing it. And if I lose, then, then I'm still loved. If I win, then I'm still loved and it doesn't change based on anything. So knowing that helps me keep, stay motivated saying, hey, there's no pressure because you're not defined by what you do. 
And I think a lot of times we have this, these ideas that, you know, what you do to define, defines who you are. And then now we're living by the expectations of, of other people. And then, if you know, that, that freaks us out a little bit because we believe that, you know, if I fail, if I lose, then I'm a loser. And if I win, then I'm a winner. And now I'm only as good as what I've ever done. And if you believe you're only good as, as what you've ever done, then you're constantly trying to validate yourself and validate your worth to other people. And so love tells you that, especially the love of God, which is unconditional, tells you that, no, you don't have to validate your love for other people. The fact that you're here, the fact that you're still breathing, the fact that you're alive means that there's a purpose, there's a plan, there's a destiny, and, and a vision for your life that goes beyond even what you understand and know. And so, so being able to share those things with, with, with those kids is, is a, a warmth to my heart, and it's it's the it's the reason why I feel like I'm here, um, or at least one of them, to, to to share my life experience with people and to share what I feel like I, that the Lord has implanted and 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 deeply shown to me in my heart, um, that that has really changed me and has really affected my identity and the way that I perceive the world around me. Because there's a lot of crazy stuff that's going on in the world, and there's a lot of people who are saying a lot of things that aren't true, and. Um, you know, if whatever we believe, we manifest in our life. And if I'm believing things that are not true in my life, you know, then, then I'm going to have a hard time um, being, I mean, I'm going to have a hard time being fulfilled and having the joy and the peace that I, that I feel like I should have or that I should have in my life. So, yeah. You mentioned Jordan Burroughs during that message. And in talking to Zeke, he, he said that uh, you remind him of Jordan early in his career. <laughs> Uh, do you see that stuff, and do you pattern yourself after Jordan Burroughs when it comes to your wrestling style and, and some things that go with it? You know what? Yes and no. Uh, I love – first of all, I love Jordan as just a person, uh, as a father, as a role model, as a wrestler. Uh, he's been one of my idols for a very long time. Um, in, in even the way that he lives his life, the way that he shares um, shares his life uh, is, is just a real inspiration to me. And so I, I really appreciate him um, as, as, you know, even, I mean, and, you know, I never, I know I like to make things about, you know, even anywhere about color or race or anything like that, but even him being, you know, a black male figure by which to look up to is, is, is an incredible thing too. And, and, and like I said, I, in Christ, I don't think that there's, there's, you know, slave free, male, female, black, white, ethnicity doesn't matter, but, you know, in this world, like, you know, that, that's the way it is. Um, so I think when it comes to Jordan, um, uh, I, I would say that, you know, what's, what's difficult is this, um, being able to recognize, see, appreciate, uh, and then take what's good about his wrestling, take what's good about um, his wrestling style and the things that he does and his mindset and, and apply them to me without becoming him. And I think that's, that's, the, that's, that's the kind of twisty part right there. Is, is trying to, you know, emulate him and kind of sh- share that. But, but with my own strength, take what's good about what he does. But then, you know, I'm, I'm Nate Sean. And, um, you know, I, I switch my leg. Jordan doesn't. You know, uh, there, there's just some differences in, in the way. But I, I feel like there's so much I can learn, so much I can pick up. And, um, and so much that I've already been able to um, gain from looking at his life. But, um, but being able to do that with by all, with with also maintaining my own individual identity um, apart from him, which um, is not against him or anything, but obviously we're two different people. The 2014 NCAA Championship Finals, you wrestled Jesse Delgado of Illinois. You dropped that match, and you were on fire. You're hitting all your shots. You're getting on the double, but he rolled through those positions. Did that match change anything on how you shot the double leg? Um, at that point in time, mm, at that point in time, mm, not necessarily, but, uh, because even my, my next, I think my next year, I don't necessarily know that like my double was my signature move. Um, or no, the next year was my junior year. Um, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I, I don't know if my, my next year I didn't do as well at the national tournament, but then the next year, my senior year, I, um, I believe that I did a, let me see. I don't know if I was hitting doubles as much. I see the thing is like my freshman year, like that this is this is where kinda comes everything kinda comes full circle because my freshman year, um, they trained me uh, at Cornell like to hit double legs. That's that's what I was that's what I was doing. 
I was hitting double legs, but I had never been a real double leg person. I don't know that I, I mean, I maybe hit one double leg my whole, my whole time. I remember like actually, you know, learning double legs like that. So I never really knew. Um, I never really knew how to, uh, I guess I, I was never really a double person. I was more of a single person, more of a knee pull person. And that, that's kind of where, um, that's kind of where I was. But, um, I think, I think more now I've got, I got a lot better at it. I've gotten a lot better at it recently. Um, I made some adjustments and then stuff just kind of stuff starts flowing. Like, you know, you learn something maybe two years ago, a year ago, a couple months ago, and then it doesn't feel good at that point in time. Then all of a sudden, you know, you practice it over and over again, or you get comfortable or you get an injury or something. And then all of a sudden stuff starts opening up and you're like, wow, this is pretty, this is pretty amazing. Um, you know, this is working out. So I think that's what I have with my double leg. My double leg just got like pretty good. And I just stuff, stuff just started to click, but it wasn't necessarily after that match though. Well, keeping that match in mind, do you like the neutral danger zone rule in college wrestling? I'm um, sorry, one more time you cut out there. Yeah, do you like the neutral danger zone rule in college wrestling? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd say yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, it definitely, it definitely awards the person who's not. I mean, it definitely awards the person who's who's, who's keeping. I guess somewhat good position and making sure that they're not, um, you know, kind of just haphazardly scrambling and, and not being aware of their back. I think it, it definitely produces uh, a high insist of high sense of awareness. And, um, and I think that that's, I think that that is good because especially if we're trying to get our guys transitioning into freestyle and we want the best guys in the world, like you can't just be rolling on your back like that. Um, haphazardly, that's a hard habit to break, especially when, you know, if if you make your living off of doing funk, like it's a hard habit to break. You were down to your last chance to win an NCAA championship your senior year. You got third, you got second, and then you got fifth. Moved up a weight class, and then it's your final chance. Was it? Yeah. Uh, did it feel like pressure? Did you feel like, hey, I just absolutely have to give this get this done this year? I mean, you had to, but what what did that feel like? Um, no, actually, no pressure at all. I had, I had, I knew that I was going to win. Um, I had not a doubt in my mind. Uh, I think it was just a matter of allowing myself to be free and, and wrestling with the ability and the skill and everything that I knew that I had inside of me. Um, no, that wasn't, and it wasn't ever, it was never a place of pressure. Like that was probably the freest I've ever, uh, freest season I've ever wrestled. And, um, it was probably the most confident I've ever been in a season. And, um, I think that, uh, my, you know, my, I guess not record, but whatever, like, I guess just my matches and the point scores, like what attest to that, um, to that reality. Cause I, I just, I just believed myself and I was confident and I figured I knew I was going to win at some point in time. I just didn't know what, at what point in time it was. And, um, and I was glad that I was glad that it, it worked out the way that, um, I felt like the Lord wanted it to work out. You're back on the, or you're on the world team reunited with your college teammate, Kyle Dake. And during the time that you've spent with him, what is the most impressive wrestling feat you've seen him accomplish or, or moment that you've seen? Uh, the cow has done? Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, gosh, that's a loaded question. There's like way too many things to count. I mean, the guy's pretty much, um, I mean, he's pretty much done most of what people would hope to and, accomplish except uh winning a world title and an olympic title um i i would say that i mean i would say even him being on the world team like i think that there's even greater feats than him making a world team this year because um i mean obviously that's great and i think that's you know i think it was a right i think it was the right timing i think it's the right time and the point of time for him um but i don't necessarily know that i can that i say that one is more value one one moment in his life is more valuable than another moment in his life i think that every moment that he's prepared for and trained for that um it's it, he's taking it personally and he's taking it he's taking it seriously and he's and um and that to to value one over the other um would 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 wouldn't um wouldn't honor 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 him so i would say that everything that he's done everything he's accomplished um you know even the the myriad of seconds that he's taken being so close 
um, that even those points like led him to to where he is now. And I don't, I don't, I didn't really see the ranking, I, I, but I know they, you know, rank pretty high in the world right now. And and hoping that he's able to show the world this year, um, just as much as the rest of our team and myself, that that yeah, we're, we're he's he's the best at his weight class um, at, at 79, and um, and that that he he's. He's been good for a long time, but he's been good. It's just, you know, when you got Jordan Burroughs and, and, and other guys who are, you know, taking third, second, first at, at Worlds and Olympics, then, you know, it's, it's kind of kind of difficult. But, um, but you know, the fact that he's, he was able to, to take all those things and be able to always bounce back better, stronger, faster, more in control, um, more technical. I mean, it, it, show, it, it, it shows everything about about him so it's and it's incredible not sure if you know your cornell history but there was a great wrestler two-time ncaa champion named travis lee who was at your weight classes uh, i just would love to think of a, a dream match between you guys w- what do you think that would look like <laughs> if you guys wrestled what's that <laughs> what, what would that look like if you and travis lee went at it i don't know if you've seen footage or anything but this guy was unreal from hawaii you're from california yeah. It'd be a great match yeah you know, it, I think it would be a great match because I, I think, um, it, it's, at least for my, for my, at least what I know about him, um, I, 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 as far as I know, he was he was just a mean, a mean kind of a wrestler too. Like he would score points, but he was he was mean and he had he was uh, extremely technical and extremely good. And 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 so you know, I I I I don't know what it would look like, but you know, I, I as Cornell as I've trained both you know training both of us, like you know, I. I was kind of mean too, so you know, as nice of a guy that I, I, I would like to assume that I am sometimes, uh, I would say that <laughs> I would say that it would be a definite brawl. It would definitely, it would, it would definitely be a fight, and uh, we're, we're, you know, we're going to score points. And we're going to, you know, uh, he might put me on my back. I might put him on his back. I might, you know, turn him on top, or you know, he might get me. But um, I, I think that between us, it would, it would. I think most importantly, it would be a, a brawl, a, a respectful. Brawl. All right. Between the two of us. How about Golden Sizemore? Is that uh, is she mean? Gold? No, she's the sweetest, uh, most petite little thing you ever you ever met. I don't think she. I've seen her hurt a fly before, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't necessarily know that she would <laughs> hurt a person though. <laughs> How, how'd she get she's that name? Anyways. Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, that name's great, Golden. Your, that's your mom, but how'd she get the name Golden? Yeah. Any idea? I believe, um, I believe my, I don't know, my grandma, I, I, it's a great question. I'm not sure what the story was behind that, but it is a great name, right? You don't hear a lot of golden, you know, maybe I'll kind of keep that one in the, in the, in the, in the bank for, for a kid or something. Cause that is a great name. Well, how about your name? Great name. Do you, what's the story behind Nashon? Well, uh, there's many stories behind it. Um, I, the, the kind of boring one is, is that my mom just, I, I don't know exactly how she did it. it. It's definitely significant. She got it out of the Bible. It's actually a Hebrew name. Nachshon is actually the the Hebrew. That's how they that's how they say it in in Israel. And um, and it's Nachshon Aaron Aaron. I don't know how to say that in Hebrew, but Aaron A A R O N. And those are both biblical names. And um, in in the Jewish history, which isn't uh, biblical, but it's just Jewish history. Uh, they 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 say that Nachshon. Uh, he he was one of the leaders of the tribe of Ju- of Judah, as as he w- as they were going out of Egypt, and so when they were moving out of Egypt after being uh, in slave slavery for two hundred something years, um, as they were coming out, they came to the, the the Red Sea, and before Moses parted the Red Sea, the, the miraculous uh, walking through the, the Red Sea by the power of God, uh, he started walking in head first, believing that God was going to do it. And so Nachshon means one who goes before, one who leads. And I would say that that is uh, a definite testament to my character because I am one who likes to, uh, to go before and lead and, um, and just, I, I just go do things. Nation, I'm going to go with the American name, so I, I can't pronounce it quite like you, but we play a series <laughs> of games we have selected the hot box for you where we ask you five questions, lock you in the sauna, hoping to make you sweat. Nashon Garrett, are you ready to go in the hot box? Let's go. All right, question number one. What is the nicest thing your twin brother Isaac has ever done for you? 
Oh, the nicest thing. Oh, when I was uh, about three years old, I was getting bullied by a kid on our, um, on our, on our street. And, uh, and, and he was making fun of me or had punched me or something. And my brother, uh, you know, just three-year-old little Isaac Garrett, Isaac Josiah Garrett came over, punched him in the stomach and then grabbed me and took me to my mom. Nice thing he's ever done for me. All right. That's, a, that's an awesome answer there. <laughs> Question number two. This is, you, you have to listen close here. Your birthday is August 21. Kenny Rogers, Usain Bolt, and Wilt Chamberlain were also born on August 21. In order to get this correct, you have to answer two of the following. Number one is name a song that Kenny Rogers is known for. How many points did Wilt Chamberlain score in a game? And what country is Usain Bolt from? If you get two out of three, you get the question correct. <laughs> Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers isn't the guy who's saying you got to know when to hold him, know when to fold him. Got it. Know when to walk away. <laughs> yeah. Gambler. Yeah. Yeah. The gambler. Yes. Yeah. Got it. I'm surprised by that. Then, so you got that one. So. Uh, and and I think um, oh god oh god oh, okay and you saying Bolt he's, he's he's Jamaica yep got it okay and then the other one would have been Wilt Chamberlain scored a hundred points in an NBA basketball what? game okay so one hundred points I would I, I would have said one hundred four or something okay but you got the question right so congratulations there uh, number three who is the best teammate you have ever had best teammate I've ever had yep. Um, best teammate ever. Can you can you be more specific? Well, yeah, you can do it however you want. It can be high school teammate. It can be college. It can be international. However you want to define it, just the the best teammate you feel represents what you would want out of a teammate. Um, I would say that having the best of both worlds and both uh, in both in both um. I would say I would say I, I'm I'm gonna just go out and throw and, and say Gabe Gabe Dean Gabe Dean was 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 probably the best teammate I've ever had because he was one of my best friends um, and it still is to this day and uh, but I I think that we we I think both us of us having the success that we had almost like the competitive nature that that we that we had too but also because um because we actually at one point in time didn't didn't really like like each other but we were st- both still like the best on our team i think that i think that there was a lot to say about that and a lot of history and a lot of like wonderful things that like we grew into as we like both matured into uh into into men hey if you don't like gabe dean you just blast double leg him nation that's the the key there and you got it to you know, do hey it. listen and and you make sure you let him know that okay because uh, I've tried to tell him this over and over again that he doesn't want no smoke. <laughs> he don't want this. <laughs> but uh, but he he I don't know he he keeps he keeps coming at me. So, yeah. so, so I, I I have to let him I let him have to fill these paws one time. I'm gonna let him fill these paws. I'll let you tell him that. I'll, I might pass on that <laughs> one. So, question number four: What song or movie is a reflection of your life? Oh, uh, song or movie is a reflection of my life. Uh, I, there's a, a song I, I really love listening to. It's kind of, it's not even a ballad. It's just it's just a it's just a, a song. Literally, the it's it's uh it's like five, six, seven words, and it says it's by Juanita Bynum, and it's I don't mind waiting, and literally that is the whole song. It, it, I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting on you, Lord. And then that's it. <laughs> and then well, there's there's key, there's key changes, and then there's levels to it, and it gets it gets intense. But it's basically like I don't mind waiting, you know. And it's it's uh, the Lord's timing is is the best timing, and uh, and the more that I I put my my trust and my hope and realize how good He is and how much He loves me, uh, the the more I don't have to worry about what doesn't go my way or what seems like it's not, uh, you know, what it seems like it's it's that's not happening or not supposed to happen or it did happen and this sucks and I don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. I'm not supposed to because um, tomorrow we'll worry about itself. Today, you know, I have everything I need. All right, you got that one right. Question five. Is it pronounced Aaron Rodgers or A.A. Ron Rodgers? I would say the latter. That's pretty clear to me. Yeah, I would too. 
I, I think that's correct because you had mentioned an Aaron earlier, so I, I wanted to maybe hear you say a a Ron. So you you got that right. So congratulations, you are five for five. You're out of the hot box. Do you want to yeah. finish with this? You you have a, a sister that was an all American in track, and then your uh, your twin brother was a, a dancer. Is that right? Yes, ballet dancer, uh, singer, all around, just good guy i mean he's probably i i would probably say he's like a, a a lyrical a lyrical genius in my opinion um with his songs his music his writing um you know i think he writes really from the depths of his soul which is a, a hard place to write from but uh you know those were the are the, where the best songs come from in my opinion and my sister is just a beast uh i think that her life is something that i would love to emulate she's probably one of the wisest people I know. Um, and that I've learned that through experience of not listening to her. And I realized, Oh wait, you are extremely wise. I should probably listen to you a little bit more. And yeah, she was, uh, an all American at Cal Berkeley. She double majored in, at, at there. So she's obviously, she's just an extremely intelligent, awesome person. She just had a baby. So she's now taking over the mother role. But I mean, she's always had the mother role, but like now she's got her own baby and her own kid to, to, to do it with and uh and so not that i'm jealous at all ever but there's there's definitely there's definitely gonna be some some words when that young man comes of age could you gun her down at a my race? little nephew how about a race between What's that? You? could you beat her in a race track race can i beat her in a race yeah. um honestly she's starting to work out and get back in shape now so honest i'm gonna i'm gonna put a uh a question mark there okay. Uh-huh. And and say, uh, you know, if you know, maybe, maybe I can beat her in a race. It depends on what kind of race and and what the obstacles are. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 what it's all about in track. If it's uh, the steeplechase, then uh, that that opens up a whole <laughs> different can of worms there. But that's hey, right, that's right. <laughs> we really appreciate this time. Great interview. Congratulations on making your first world team. It's going to be fun to see how you do in Hungary at the World Championships. Excited to see how this twenty eight team. 2018 team is going to do and congratulations on being part of it okay awesome wait is it budapest or hungary that we're going to both well, both yeah <laughs> budapest is the uh the capital city and hungary budapest, is the country hungary. yep you got okay. it okay all right you got it you, see, so. you know i blame the school system for that your cornell education didn't get it to you. I, I do not know my world geography as well as i should but neither does any other american yeah that's true so. <laughs> But thanks for being on the show. For Andy Hamilton and Nashawn Garrett, I'm Kyle Klingman. You've been listening to On The Mat. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.